Hello everyone to this webinar on performance management in a hybrid world. Um, myself, uh, Lars Highland, who I am uh, the Chief Learning Officer at Totra Learning. And, and for those um, who were on the chat earlier, um, will know I'm speaking to you from a, a, a Spanish thinker in, on, the, on the south coast of Spain today. I'm normally based in Brighton, the UK, uh, where the rest of the Totra team in EMEA are normally based. Um, I'm delighted to be um, really hosting this session for Danny Johnson, um, who is the co-founder and principal of Red Thread Research. Hi, Danny. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing great. Good, good, good. Um, which is great because we're talking about performance management. So, you know, we want to make sure that you get good feedback um, or uh, positive, constructive feedback, should we say, uh, by the end of this, this session. So... Um, Without uh, further ado, I'm just, I'll just acknowledge the fact that we've got a good range of people from around the world, uh, France. We have uh, some c committed souls also in, in New Zealand, which is fantastic because uh, Totra's HQ is based in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, we're, we're global as an, as an organization, but um, delighted to, to, to welcome you there as well. So without further ado, let's crack on. Um, Danny, really over to you uh, and uh, lead us through the changing world of performance management. Roger that, Lars. I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's early morning for me. For, for me, um, I saw that someone's joining from New Zealand at 3 a.m. and that is crazy. So, but, but welcome, and I hope I can keep you awake during this time. Um, today, we're going to talk about performance management in a hybrid world. At Red Thread, we've been looking at performance management for the last three-ish years. We've done a longitudinal study that sort of looks at practices over each year. We've collected data from all three of those years. Um, <clears throat> the data for this year isn't quite ready to, to spill yet, but uh, I'll, I'll let you get in touch with me and we'll, we'll be happy to share that data once it's, once it's ready to go. I wanna start uh, just with a little explanation of who we are. We are a research, and advisor, a research and advisory firm out of the United States, although we focus globally. We uh, focus on people analytics, learning and career performance, which we'll be talking about today, employee experience, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, and then all of the technology that supports all of those things. So if you have any needs in these areas, please feel free to get a hold of me. If you're just interested in what we do, our website is right there at the top of the screen and uh, you're welcome to explore. So how we're going to spend this hour, I want to give you a short history lesson on performance management, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the research and a model we've put together for effective performance management. Um, and then what, what it takes to actually get started in this. Things have changed quite a bit, and so as we talk about hybrid, what do we need to do in order to sort of get started and put something in place in our organizations that is going to work? Just so you know that I'm not making this stuff up, I wanted to reference the, the couple of studies that we've gotten out already. There's also one that takes a, a really good look at gender diversity issues with respect to performance management that I haven't included here, but I will quote a little bit. If you're interested in any of these studies, please let me know. The one on the left-hand side of the screen was done right before COVID, and the one on the right-hand side of the screen was done about a year later. So we have a really good comparison about what was happening before and what was happening after the initial lockdown, and um, that's, that's the information that we'll be going off of today. So let's start with a history lesson. Um, performance managements have been around for a really long time. About the turn of the last century, people started leaving their farms and coming into the cities to work, and then the whole efficiency movement happened, and that meant that we started dividing work into distinct roles. So it wasn't just a bunch of people doing a single thing or one person following the process all the way through. We started having very distinct roles, and those roles had measures, and for the first time, possibly in history, we were able to compare people's work to each other. And because we could do that, organizations wanted to know who was perform performing well and um, or helping the efficiency and the production, as, as we understood it, of the organization. And they wanted to compensate commensurate on the perform performance. So for the first time, they were like, well, this person performs better, so we're going to give them more money. It's not just about expertise. It's about throughput and those types of things. And because work was designed um, in, uh, to, to sort of accommodate that rigid world and the rigid steady processes in that world, the way that we determined who was performing well was also pretty rigid and pretty steady. So performance was judged off efficiency measures, 
um, things like pieces per hour or time to complete, measures like that. Today though, um, work has changed quite a bit and in the last year and a half to two years, even more. We still have roles that are a little bit rote and standardized in nature because that's the history of how we've done things, although that's increasingly changing. But we are increasingly asking employees to do different stuff, non-standard stuff. And we need them to be able to innovate and think outside the box in order to stay ahead of our competition. And that has created some problems for us with respect to some of the more traditional performance management processes, because work is a much, much harder measure. If you're on an assembly line, you can measure throughput and you can measure how long it takes to do piecework. But how, what do you do with things like failure? Failure is a really necessary thing in order to innovate, but it's also completely subjective. What may be one person's failure may be another person's discovery. And so one person failing in one role can also have some pretty extraordinary, it leads to some pretty extraordinary advances, but it's not always obvious at the time. And so we can't even judge that person in the time that that thing happens. And the time it takes to fail and the cost to the organization can have an immediate negative impact, but over time, it can lead to some really interesting things. So some of the more traditional practices that we used to use to measure became in, became pretty obsolete. They're, they they don't work as well, although we keep on trying to force them into our more our, our less traditional systems now. And with the pandemic came a couple of different challenges. So not only did we have to distinguish between high and low performers, we had to do it without the benefit of managing while walking around. And that's a, I don't know if he coined the phrase, but Michael Scott from the office um, uses that phrase a lot. I'm managing while walking around, I'm dropping in um, and I can visibly see what's going on. And so drop-ins and that idea of visibly seeing what somebody's doing disappeared. And so did a lot of the help that individuals got when, when being co-located, when everyone's in the same place, a manager can see when someone's struggling and help them a little bit more uh, to increase their performance. And while um, the pandemic is, is actually receding in some areas, not where I am, but in some areas, um, I think the, the ideas that sort of came forth during that pandemic have forever changed the minds of employees about what they want. They want options, they want different, different types of things. And the great resignation is real. We saw double the resignations um, in the early part of the summer than we did in, in previous years. And this affects any plans that organizations had about returning to the old ways of doing performance management. So even if you had, you know, what we saw is last year at this time, people started panicking about the performance management process and they basically said, and eh, we're gonna punt. We, we're just gonna give everybody a satisfactory and then we're gonna wait a year and then everything will be back to normal. But we've been at this for a year and a half. And in that time, employees have gotten smart and decided they want something different. And so any, any dreams that we had about returning to how we were doing things before is, is pretty much shot. Danny, just a quick question really for you, because here in the UK, there's it's almost like a yo-yo effect, it feels like, or uh, going in and out, or there's, a, there's been a recent growing pressure or attraction back into the office space, particularly in big cities, obviously. And yet we're already looking at a, at a winter where you know, a lot of the protocols will just come back into place probably. So it's really challenging, I imagine, for organizations to manage around that. So would you would you say that that puts pressure on being almost like a remote first compared to uh, office space approach? Y yes, <laughs> I guess the short answer is probably, probably yes. Um, and because we're seeing the same thing over here, some of the big Tech companies, for example, and some of the big uh, financial institutions got a lot of press because they basically said, hey, no, everyone's coming back to the office. And, and then it keeps on getting pushed back further and further and further. And employees are writing mean letters to the press about how they don't want to come back. And, and so um, it is, I think it's fundamentally changing the minds of the, the leaders and especially the people leaders about what is going to happen in the future. I think up until fairly recently, we all thought we were going to go back and that everybody loves to work in the office, um, which I never understood because I'm not one of those people. Um, but uh, we're, we're seeing it take hold as sort of a movement. Let us work where we want. It doesn't matter anymore. And with that comes some pretty serious changes about how we judge productivity. It's no longer just the face time in the office anymore or getting the attention of the boss. It's actually having to figure out what productivity means in this new world. 
Um, just a stat for you, 83% of uh, workers prefer a hybrid model, which doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information about how that might affect organizations, hybrid work models are used by 63% of high growth companies. Now, obviously we have to be careful with that little piece of data because high growth companies are more likely to use a, a, a hybrid model. Um, but it does speak a little bit to high growth companies and the things that they're doing that may impact the future and how they're going to be looking at workforces in the future. High growth companies also have the ability, excuse me, high, organizations that embrace a hybrid model also have the ability to choose talent from everywhere. So, so they don't have to worry about just choosing it out of the Silicon Valley or wherever you, you happen to be sitting. Uh, it opens up the floodgates to finding the best talent, which also probably affects that, that high growth status of those organizations. So this is what getting it wrong looks like. Um, we did We've done a couple of studies within organizations themselves. And my favorite quote of all of the PM studies we've done is, our PM process is like being managed with the pointy end of a stick. Nobody likes it. Very few people think that they're fair. Um, and very few people think that the leaders have all, the all of the information they need in order to make good decisions about how people are performing. And I think all of this is based on the fact that expectations are different now. We want more um, visibility into how those decisions are made. And we need to understand how we're being judged. It's no longer enough to say you're a one because you didn't form, perform as well as so-and-so. I want to understand why I didn't perform as well. And if I'm not happy with the answer, I have other options. So the good news is that uh, even before the pandemic happened, some, some positive changes were starting to take hold. Now, this isn't true in all organizations. I wouldn't even say they're true in most organizations, but most of the leaders that we talked to were at least aware of some of these changes and were interested in thinking through them a little bit more. So the first one is the, the, the purpose. So as I mentioned before, performance management came, came around because we wanted to fairly compensate individuals. And so it was much more in support of administrative decisions. Now we're seeing it being used to drive performance and engagement. So we're not just worried about making those good decisions, although we are worried about that. We're also worried about actually improving the performance as we go throughout the year. And we're also very, very interested in engaging our workforce because we don't want them to leave. The second change that we're seeing is cadence. And this blew up as soon as the pandemic happened. Um, we used to rely on a single rating once a year and some organizations still do. But what we're seeing more and more of are these ongoing discussions and these ongoing check-ins to make sure that we understand and that the employee understands exactly where they are at all times so that there aren't any big surprises at the end of the year. The third big change that we've seen are ratings. We used to talk about an annual performance evaluation and that was one event where you sat down and had this heart to heart with your boss. Now we're seeing many evaluation methods and we're gonna get a little bit into that in a, in a little bit, but it's no longer just the manager as the oracle of truth. We're seeing many evaluation methods and many sources of data used to determine what performance means. The next one is, is goals. So we used to set goals once a year and I don't know how many of you have actually completed a goal um, that you set at the beginning of the year, but I don't think I have ever put a goal in place in January that was still valid in December. And that is likely more true now as organizations are having to pivot and take advantage of, of new ways of work. It just doesn't work the same way that it did. And so instead of annual goal setting, that one conversation you have with your boss, we're seeing dynamic and continuous goal setting. We're seeing people actually sit down once a month and say, okay, are these still valid? Do we need to change them? What needs to, you know, what, what can I do instead of this that is gonna be more helpful to the organization? And then finally, focus. Uh, the focus of performance management has changed from something that we do when we're looking back to give somebody a report card to something that's a little bit more future oriented. Hey, you're good at this. Have you thought about maybe moving in this direction with your career? So it's much more, hey, we see a future with you in, the, within, in our organization. What can we actually do to help get you there versus here's your report card. Don't bug me until next year. So that's all really, really good news. Um, what I wanna do now is sort of take us through a model for thinking about performance management. We usually, when we think performance management, and especially right now, as we're nearing the end, Q4 in a lot of organizations, we're picturing this 
this end of year nightmare that takes three months of everybody's time and leaves everybody fairly unsatisfied. Last year in particular um, was interesting because again, most people just punted, um, but we're not back to normal and we really do have to address this. And so we wanna talk about what things actually affect the things that we're trying to affect with performance management and how they can be affected. And I wanna start by introducing this model. So this model, as I mentioned, it came out of our first study. We revalidated it with the second study and the third study, um, and it will be revalidated, I'm assuming, this fall. There might be slight changes, but overall, it'll probably be revalidated. When we talk about performance, um, every organization has some different goals. The three that we identified were um, organizational performance. We want our organizational performance to get better. We want our individual performance to get better. And the other one that just popped so strong is employee engagement. When we were talking to leaders, they mentioned this over and over again as one of the reasons they do performance management. They want to engage with their employees. Interestingly, we found uh, three levers or three things that organizations can do to affect performance within, within that organization. The first one was culture. So having a culture of performance is an important aspect of performance management. It's not just that year of end the system or process, it's, it's something that exists and lives within the culture. Culture impacts organizational performance as you would expect, but it also impacts employee engagement. And we'll talk about the, the three Fs there in just a second. The second thing uh, to, to my chagrin that popped is really, really important was this idea of capability of, of managers. And that, in, that affects individual performance, which makes a lot of sense cognitively, it just makes sense. Um, but the data also, there was a very, very strong correlation between the managers and how they were perceived as being capable and the individual performance of, that in, of, of the people, of the employees. And then the final one was clarity, clarity for today and clarity for tomorrow. And that impacts employee engagement. So if we have a vision toward the future and if we understand what's going on, employee engagement went up. So let's take each one of these and talk about kind of what they look like. So the first one is, is culture. Culture turned out to be a pretty big deal. Um, it has a really large impact on both organizational performance and employee engagement, as I mentioned. And that reinforces the idea that um, creating the environment for performance is as important as the specific tactics that you use in order to measure performance. And within the culture there, there are these three specific areas that drive performance. The first one is the fairness or the perception of fairness. The second one is feedback. And the, sec the third one is um, information that can help the employee perform better and have a future focus and develop and, and grow into the future. When we talk about culture in general, we're talking about the shared assumptions, values, and behaviors that determine how we do things around here. And that's actually a definition from Deloitte, that's the one that they use, um, that help organizations and people thrive. And so when we're talking about a PM culture, we're not just talking about, um, when we're talking about a PM culture, we're actually talking about the things that we do as an organization that we, that we sort of infuse the environment with that helps us all perform better. A little bit of data here, a little bit of scary data. Um, this 17% represents the decline of psychological safety in organizations compared to immediately before the pandemic. So psychological safety in organizations dropped 17 points as soon as we went to a hybrid or a work from home model. Um, some of that obviously may have been affected by the radical changes that some organizations had to make. Um, but overall people felt less sure and less able to bring their whole selves to work and to participate as their, as their, as their whole selves uh, in their organizations immediately after the, the pandemic. When we talk about PM culture in a hybrid world, we're talking about three things, as I mentioned, fairness, feedback, and future. And I wanna take each one of those uh, and, and dive just a little bit deeper. Fairness um, is not just the processes. It's also the environment. So when we think about fairness, we think about, okay, are we using the right judgments to determine whether or not somebody is performing well? And those things are very, very important. If you don't have fairness in your PM process, nothing else matters. It is sort of table stakes. People have to perceive it as fair. And unfortunately, only about 63% of people perceive their PM processes as fair. Um, 
even in organizations where people are rated fairly high, they still see the, the process overall as unfair. And organizations have done a lot to sort of combat that. They do one-on-one -on -one conversations and then they can do calibration and then they do all kinds of these other things to make it seem fair or feel fair. But in most organizations, it just doesn't feel that fair. And when we talk about um, fairness, we're not just talking about those things, the processes, we're also talking about the environment. And so research shows that passive FaceTime or my boss sees me sitting in my seat. And that's, you know, when workers are not in an inactive, let me read this because I want to get it right. When workers are not in active interactions with coworkers or clients, but instead just being seen in the workplace, that positively influences supervisors' performance scores. So just, just the act of being there will raise your performance score, which is a really bad deal for those that are working from home most of the time. Specifically, employees who performed equally, sorry, employees that performed equally based on objective measures received higher performance scores if they had more passive face time. So our data showed that even if they were doing the same type of output, if they were there, they were perceived as more go-getter and better performers. The problem obviously is that managers can't always see any, everybody from home. Um, and we've seen some pretty massive burnout as employees try to solve this problem by being always accessible. So, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, people said, yeah, go ahead and work from home. Your bosses are like, yes, work from home. We need to work from home. And then instead of being able to work a nine to five or, you know, nine hours as spread out throughout the day that made sense to you, you were always on, you were always answering email, you were always available on Slack and Teams. You were always doing these things because you wanted to make sure that you still had that face time that you intuitively knew was important and that your boss could always get a hold of you. And that led to some pretty massive burnout. The organizations need to start building different sorts of expectations. So not so much based on where or how you're working, but on the outcomes instead. And orgs need to rethink what good means. And so instead of, instead of using uh, presence, whether it's online presence or in-person presence as a measure, we need to train our managers and make them aware that that is an unconscious bias that we're using to judge whether or not someone is performing well. One company, Danny, we Danny, one example, uh, I just wanted to comment on that is that there's just recently um, hearing about the dissolving of the weekend um, because of the results of people working from home, but also or in hybrid environments, but also it, it essentially those traditional boundaries of weekend um, and which which you immediately think is a bad thing. Yeah, but equally, there's there can be some benefits to it if it's managed better and I think we're all probably struggling with trying to work out what that better looks like but there's certainly some fundamental change isn't there in the way we yeah. define the work boundaries. For sure there was a I read a book recently that changed my life I recommend that everybody read it it's called 4,000 weeks and 4,000 weeks basically applies to the number of weeks that you have in your life. It's a, a rough estimate of the number of weeks you have to live. And that sort of puts a boundary on it, like how we think about time. The whole book is basically a treatise on time, how we treat time. And one of the points that he makes that I think is a really important one for us is it's not just time. Like there are all these productivity hacks and, you know, working from home and working however you want to work is good in some ways. But the thing that it does is it, it scatters our shared time. So when I'm busy, it's not that when I'm too busy to have lunch with a friend, it's not that I'm so busy that I literally don't have a minute. It's that I'm busy and she's busy at different times. And so we don't have that time to connect together. And so as we think through what this looks like in the future for our organizations and for our, 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 ourselves and our families and our, our personal lives, that shared time is a really important part of downtime. It's not just not doing anything. It's sharing this sense of community with people that really helps us sort of rejuvenate. And so even in organizations where um, you can work wherever, it's still probably pretty important to build in those norms that we're not going to send emails after five or we're, you're not expected to answer after a, a certain amount of time. Go ahead and work those hours if those are the, the hours that you want to work. But this idea of shared time is, is an important aspect of that as well. I wanted to give an example of an organization that solved this. Uh, they, had a, they have a hybrid workforce. And basically what they realized is that people in the office were having water cooler meetings and, and meeting together and, and having these, these conversations where half, half of the team members weren't there. And so they immediately made a plan that if one person is not there on the team, everybody goes to their computers and logs in. 
So, so we're defaulting to, as, as you mentioned earlier, lawyers probably remote. But, but they did that because they wanted to make sure that there was equity, that everybody was getting the same information and that we were treating everybody fairly when these decisions were made and when, when things needed to happen. The second one is feedback. Um, our survey revealed that feedback cultures have a 30% higher likelihood of high engagement and 108% higher likelihood of high organizational performance. So feedback is stinking important. It is very, very, very important. And the reason is because it provides resources. The reason is uh, because it helps disseminate some of that information that we were talking about. When we're giving direct feedback, we're directly affecting people's ability to perform better in the organization. And some of the ways that we've seen uh, organizations do this is to provide resources to employees to help give and receive feedback. So a lot of times in organizations when we give the feedback training, it's usually to managers. And it's usually, it usually revolves around hard information. Like you're screwing up, let me give you that information in a compliment sandwich or, or whatever the, the latest trend is. In the organizations that we talked to that were doing this well, they actually gave the employees and the managers training about how to give and receive feedback. And that was crucial because when you ask for feedback, you're much more likely to internalize it and use that feedback than when somebody is forcing that feedback on you. You're also more likely to get feedback that can help you improve if you're the employee that is asking for feedback. Um, also, you're the one that, <laughs> that has the biggest, uh, the biggest, uh, I want to say horse in the game, but I'm trying not to use too many colloquialisms. The, the biggest, you have the biggest reason for wanting that feedback. And so if you can uh, successfully ask for and get feedback, then your performance will go up. The second one is um, these organizations are encouraging open and honest feedback between peers. So it's not just manager to employee, it's also peer to peer. Um, and they're encouraged to ask peers for feedback and give feedback that way. And some of them are even putting systems and processes into place to force that a little bit until they get used to it. And then finally, and I thought this one was really interesting, the idea of enabling peer to peer recognition. So recognition is a big part of feedback too. A lot of times when we think of feedback, we think of criticism, but in cases of organizations doing this well, they really celebrated peer-to-peer -peer recognition. They, they encouraged people to, to, to speak up when somebody had done something well and took a few minutes in every meeting to call out people that were doing something extraordinary or different or had a, had a large effect. Danny, um, just wanted to interject with a question that came up from Brian, um, because it relates to what you're talking to, which was uh, about managers and the relationship between managers and, and, and their team members, etc. But um, his, the sort of question was framed as, should we start with getting better managers before we even consider performance management? Or is this a chicken and egg thing? <laughs> so... Um... Yes, if you can find better managers, by all means, get better managers. But what we found is that organizations that say that they don't have very good managers is because they're not supporting those managers. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, prom we'll promote individual contributors to a manager position, and then we'll leave them. We'll give them a, a day or two of training and say, hey, here's how you give some feedback and send them on their way. They're still individual contributors. They don't understand their roles as managers. They don't understand how to, to, to do some of those things. And so we don't provide them the support or the tools they need, and we don't hold them accountable for being good managers. We hold them accountable to getting work done, which is more of an ind individual contributor directing and, and, and sharing that work. And so before you fire all your managers and hire, hire new ones, which will probably cost quite a bit of money, um, just a few things can help, you know, change, change that. The first one is holding managers accountable, you know, regularly following up with them and saying, okay, how are you developing your team? Who on your team is struggling? How, you know, what kinds of support are you offering your team that, that you need to in order? And, and saying to the manager, this person is failing. That's as much your failure as it is that person's failure. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to offer tools and support. One organization that we uh, talked to, and I actually really love this idea, they realized that their managers weren't very good at this and they were hesitant to have these conversations. And so what they did is they structured 12 newsletters, one for each month, and they structured a conversation in every one of those newsletters that the manager was supposed to have with their, with their direct reports. So one month it was on you know, goal setting for the year. One month it was on where, where do you see yourself in a few years? One month it was on what would you like to learn? One month it was on performance and so on and so forth. And so the, those conversations became a regular part of the check-ins, but they were supported. They were given a conversation to have 
And because the whole organization was doing it, there was a little bit more sort of peer pressure or it was in the water that al and allowed them to have that conversation to a greater extent. That's a great example of the link between performance management and engagement, isn't it? I mean, in yeah. terms of, you, for me, it's the, you can see in that example how intertwined it is because one positively reinforces the other. Um, and also in environments where it's not done well, <laughs> it undermines the other, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, uh, so that's a great example. I think that's, uh, that's one, to, one to, to sort of uh, follow up on. So, so, and I want to go back to, to feedback. So on the screen, I have more types of feedback. We've talked about like the different types of feedback, like positive, negative, and, and all those types. There are also like just different types of um, feedback, like um, not just using the manager as the be all end all of how that person is doing. So today, if from a research performance management typically draws on about four feedback sources in addition to managers. So direct reports, 360s, peers, managers and senior leaders. So all of those are, are providing information about how that person is doing. And then we're seeing two others crop up. One is customer feedback or client feedback. We're actually asking the client how their experience is and, and helping provide information to the individual. And the second one is technology. There's some pretty cool technologies out there that help us gather information about performance. Some of it is AI and some of it is much more old school. Um, but, but technology is playing a, a larger uh, role than it, than it has in the past. Um, and the research actually shows that crowdsourcing feedback rather than relying on just the manager's take can give lots better insights and, and really reduce bias, which is another one of the huge hot buttons in organizations right now. Women generally get less feedback and less specific feedback as do other minorities. And so this is a way to, you know, providing feedback from many more sources is a way to sort of combat sort of our natural inclination to look for people like us. <clears throat> All right, so for the future, the last one in this, in, in culture, um, Future-focused organizations have a 27% higher likelihood of high engagement, which is huge, and a 90% higher likelihood of organizational performance. So those that are actively trying to help their organizations develop for the future are doing so much better. Um, and we see two ways that that's happening. The first one is to offer mentorships and sponsorships and, and coaching and, and those types of things. And the other is to offer gig projects and other opportunities. And this helps for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, is that um, organizational network analysis data shows that people's professional networks have shrunk during the pandemic. We aren't reaching out to as many people. We're not bumping into as many people. And so that's really contracted. And when that contracts, then uh, converse, uh, development contracts. We don't have as much information as we used to because the information lines tend to follow social connection lines. And so we're not doing our work as well, but we're also not developing our networks to increase our ability to get information that can help us do our jobs. The second thing is that senior leaders need to maintain access to individuals, period. Um, and individuals at different points in the organizational network so that they can really understand what's happening outside of the bubble of their day-to-day -day responsibilities. Um, and this is particularly important at this time when we have a pandemic going on and, and work from home. And so offering this ability to think toward the future and have discussions about people and what they're des desiring in the future really helps to sort of solidify what's going on and, and open up those lines of communication and information that are harder. They're just harder now because we're, we're all working from home. Any questions on this before I go to the next one? Um, not specifically. There's a more general question about an example of technology that is providing data on performance. Quite a broad one. Uh, obviously, Twitter <laughs> is a good example, but I'll come that on to that later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, but, can uh, you, I can give you a really sexy example. Um, there's a, a small company out there called uh, Cultivate, and basically they sit on top of your email system and read six months of email data, and they're able to determine how you're communicating with your team. And then when you go to write an email to, to Lars, um, and you're using maybe terse language or not taking into account something that you should know, it'll pop up a little thing that says, hey, you may want to reword that message. Lars's engagement is really low right now. Or what can you do in this certain instance to help Lars engage a little bit more? And so, so there are examples of that. Um, and then there are also some, some of the more traditional examples, which just put into place processes that help us gather information along the way. Um, once a month, 
there's a little note that goes out that says, hey, have you checked in with your manager, yes or no? Um, just, just little things like that that help sort of solidify and put these things into the culture to make sure that they're happening well. All right, the second one, um, and my favorite, is this idea of uh, manager capability. And one of my favorite quotes from the study was, we have the belief that performance lives between the relationship of the leader and the direct report. So this organization was so sure that leaders were the most important aspect of performance management that they dedicated quite a few resources to make sure that happened. When we started this study, I actually um, was wondering exactly how important managers, managers were. So I think, Brian, you asked the question before, should we just get rid of all our managers? We've heard that so many times. Nobody's happy with their managers and especially their frontline managers. I was wondering what would happen if you just went around the managers. What if you just provided the data to the individual rather than, than having that relationship with that manager. And it turns out that I was completely wrong. Like that, that's a bad idea, <laughs> it's a, a really bad idea. Managers are really, really important to the performance management process, but they're also very important to the performance of the organization in general. The capability of managers was the single biggest influencer on individual performance of anything else that we looked at. It's a huge deal, that relationship is a huge deal. So good managers are really, really crucial to helping employees perform, especially in three, uh, by doing three specific things. The first one is coaching. The second one is clearing barriers. And the third one is candor, being really upfront about what's going on. Uh, um, Danny, Danny, good, yeah. they're three good points. Um, I just wanted to, there was a comment actually raised by Wynne uh, about Diane Gerson at IBM, where they, they said they had to remove 300 managers. And if you know anything about this, he's just asking how they, you know, how do they replace these 300? So I think the the um, the question sort of allays to that, you know, what 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 are they doing <laughs> of value? Um, and are, you know, are you throwing the throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, sort of reaction? Which makes yeah, sense. I mean, I think yeah, I think IBM in their case they were making a statement. They're saying, hey, if you're going to be a bad manager, and if we can't correct you in that, you're out. Like we we don't have time for that crap. Um, most organizations that I know have realized that the onus for bad managers generally falls on the organization and the structure, um, and they're doing what they can to, to change that. Uh, but I'm all about getting managers out too. Uh, Dave Ulrich, who I used to work for in my younger days, once said, the most strategic thing you can do is place your bad employees with your competitor. So yeah. if now for you, go ahead and put them somewhere else. When when added an extra comment, you said that Diane Gerson said a bad manager is six times toxic, implying good managers are maybe ten times positive. So there's a sort of yeah polarizing effect. <laughs> For sure. I think I think anybody who's ever quit a manager understands that really really well. Yeah, and that's the primary reason, isn't it, that people tend to to quit is is that they cite that. Yeah. Mm. Um, to start this conversation, I want to introduce a few numbers. The first one is that 13% fewer employees understand their current level of performance contribution compared to immediately before the pandemic. So this could be because jobs got all wishy-washy when the pandemic started, but there's a sense of uncertainty about performance level because managers aren't communicating that down the way that they were before. And they weren't doing a fantastic job before, just, just to be perfectly clear. Uh, we don't think that managers suddenly got worse. That's that's not what we're saying here. We actually think the rules changed on them quite a bit. Um, it was easier to give feedback uh, to employees and give them a sense of where they stood before. And at least when, when at least some of your workforce is a little bit remote, the tactics need to, to change to ensure that employees are getting that information, whereas they used to maybe just soak it up a little bit. Um, this is the second bit of data that I wanted to share. If we dive into that idea just a little bit more, we uh, see that there are some significant differences or not um, for managers before and after the pandemic. The first one is that they get fewer data-based insights or perceived that they do at least. You may have the same systems and processes in place, but the data is perceived to be less than it was before. There are fewer functional leaders that are sharing short-term strategic objectives. So organizations don't know where they're going or why they're going that direction. Um, this is incredibly important, especially if you're changing direction, like we've seen a lot of organizations do during the pandemic. 
And then the third one is employees have less access to learning resources and skill building opportunities. And I don't know about you, Lars, but I saw this to a huge extent when the pandemic hit, the whole world panicked because they were trying to figure out how to get their classroom training online. Um, they probably shouldn't have been worried about that. They should have been worried about maybe learning and developing in different ways, but that was that was a big thing. And it hit not just the L&D department and managers, but also employees and their perception of their ability to learn and grow. Absolutely, I would agree. And you know what we saw um, is that you know, those, those, I mean, many of our Totoro customers, you know, have, have for some time had flexibility in the approach that they could deliver learning. So it's quite blended in, in their design approaches. And I, the comment I'm making is that if you've got the blended design skills, you know, if you can think about how that learning experience um, is, is delivered, it's going to be multi-channel. It's not any one thing. So those organizations that were naturally focused on in-person sessions for example clearly they were in trouble <laughs> they couldn't do those um, but then they might have naively flipped just to complete you know to zoom sessions back-to-back -back zoom sessions without re any real consideration as to what that experience is like so so the so, so i think that that hybrid you could we could reuse that word hybrid learning design as much as blended but essentially it's it's a more nuanced and sophisticated i think approach that is going to be better. So irrespective of the circumstances. So that would be my main um, um, recommendation on, on that front. I like that. I, I agree with that. And I think, um, I think organizations are finally getting there. It's taken a little while, but a year and a half later, I think they're realizing, again, we're not gonna go back to how things work. It's, that's, it's gone, it's over. Um, let's talk a little bit about what this means for a hybrid world. The, the first one was coaching, and I put three suggestions. The report that we're going to share with you uh, in the, the follow-up email from Lars will have the entire report, and you can read it, but just three suggestions for these things. The first one is coaching. Um, we're currently in the middle of doing a coaching study, and I've been surprised at how many organizations have picked up on this idea of the importance of coaching for managers. The days when managers only directed are gone. We are in the midst of this great resignation. People are leaving all the time. And that means that employees have lots and lots and lots of options. And they want to learn and grow. That's, they want to do that. So very few employees that we've talked to don't want to do better in their role. Almost everybody wants to improve. But they need the opportunities for direction and self-reflection in ways that maybe we're not offering them right now through, through coaching. Along with coaching, one of the things that popped in this research more than any other thing that you can do with coaching is this idea of failure. Um, we need to address failure differently in organizations than we have in the past. Managers have a responsibility to help employees learn from mistakes and not just hold them accountable for those mistakes. And again, I think this is something that has been easier uh, in the past because we were face-to-face. -face, and so you could have that sort of eye-to-eye, knee-to-knee conversation about what needed to be different. We have to figure out how to replicate that when half of your workforce is at home. Um, I think in some ways, this idea of failure is a little bit easier and a little bit harder in the hybrid world. Many of the really strict systems and the ways that we did things in the past just sort of blew up, which gives employees a lot of space to try new things and, and collaborate and, and do, do things differently than they have in the past. But it also really requires a manager to understand intent and look at the outcome rather than sticking to some of the traditional methods that we've used for measuring success. Um, there's a small company that we talked to for this study. Uh, their CEO, I had the chance to talk to their CEO and he did something really amazing. What he did is each of his direct reports had to have four intelligent failures every year. So that's not just trying something and having it fail. It's like intentionally going after something that they thought was probably gonna work and having it fail. And what that did is it, it changed two things. The first one is it changed the culture about how the organization thought about failure. It was a learning opportunity. It was an, an opportunity to make things better. And the second thing is, is it took the fear out of failure. It wasn't a, a scary thing or something that you were gonna be castigated for. It was actually something that was sort of revered within that organization, which I think is great. The second thing uh, that managers need to do better is they need to clear barriers. Um, and they need to do this much better than they currently are. Um, one of the things that we find that is a big barrier to people is, is that idea that I suggested before, uh, time. Time is a, a really big thing. We don't have the time or we're 
are, are the people that are working for us are using their time on things that, that aren't that helpful because they're trying to make their way through weird systems and processes. And sometimes just the, a phone call from a manager or helping them, them sort of think through it with the manager clears that barrier right up. Rob Cross actually launched his book yesterday um, on Mike, it's micro, shoot, I'm gonna screw this up and I just barely talked to him. Uh, it's all about smart collaboration. So collaboration all the time is not a great idea, but smart collaboration and maybe setting aside time for collaboration is a really good idea. In our organization, what we've done is we've blocked off an hour and a half strip every single day where we do collaboration internally. So it's never a sort of the flyby, hey, got a second. We reserve all those conversations for an hour and a half when everyone is expecting it, which frees up the rest of the day to, to you know, do some of those things that, that those small conversations would create barriers to do. So it's rethinking the way that we interact with each other and rethinking the, the things that may be causing us strife because of traditional systems and processes that are in place that we can clear up really quickly as managers. We just need to be aware of them and, and do it a little bit better. Yeah, Danny, that, that's something that the Totra um, with our talent um, experience platform really does promote because with the, the Totra Engage features that we have that allows anyone with some structure to sort of spin up a workspace and get action learning or, or a project going. So facilitating groups of people to find each other across an organization, so breaking barriers down like that, you know, cutting across silos typically, cross-functional sort of working um, can really accelerate problem solving and, and, and sort of innovative ideas being captured and worked on together in a, in a more meaningful fashion you know so you say so it's yeah. not lost in the ether or just one little part of the organization racing ahead on some solution that actually the rest of the organization would massively benefit from so making building that transparency and as you say building the safety the psychological safety to, to share like that is really critical i i actually i love that idea i'm a big fan of systems that help us do that um two two more points i was talking to a, a brand new ceo they just barely got seed funding and he was complaining that one of his managers was uh not doing what she should and i said does she know what she should do and he said uh i, I think she does <laughs> i said no, no no that's not the answer she needs to know she needs to know what she's doing and so i introduced asana if any of you know what that is it's a project management software that we use like crazy within our organization that makes every single piece of work visible. So anytime we've even got Lars using it for, for this webinar, but um, we, anytime anybody asks for anything, we immediately put a task in the system so nothing gets dropped. So everybody knows what they're doing. And so that, so that there is a very clear record of, of how people are performing and what they're doing. And it sounds Lars like uh, your system does a little bit of that as well. Just keeping track of things and making sure that people are, are aware of, of what's available and what they need to do. Yeah, certainly is. I mean, if, if you think about it as the connections of, so what comes up in a performance review at individual or team level turns itself, should turn itself into some actions, right? And, and those actions might are usually going to be linked to collaborating with others, should do, but doing that in a productive fashion. So being able to make that friction free is, yeah. is really the goal here, uh, no matter which mix of tools you end up using. I see that Lee Cooper asks, is that a bit like protected learning time? Absolutely. Yes. Um, some organizations we know set aside one week, some of them, or one, one day a week, some set aside, a, sorry, not a day a week, a couple of hours a week or an hour a day, a quarter for learning and growing and development. We think that's a brilliant idea. Other things that we've seen that work well is just blocking off work time. So everybody gets two hours of deep work every day where nobody interrupts just to help clear some of those barriers that sometimes time creates. The final thing on uh, manager capability is this idea of candor. Organizations where the manager was high in candor or where people thought they were very candid were 10% more likely to also have high levels of individual performance. Candor can sometimes be very difficult for managers for many of the reasons that we've already talked about. A lot of times they don't have the training. A lot of times it's uncomfortable and they just don't want to do it. Um, but it's increasingly important that individuals understand not just where they stand, but where the organization in general stands. Where are we going? We, they, it allows them to make better decisions and have more um, a, a bigger feeling of safety uh, if, if they understand exactly where the organization is going. One quick example here, um, 
a manager at a big uh, manufacturing firm handled performance management completely different than the rest of his firm. They, the, the processes that was in place was like at the end of the year, you do your three month thing that takes everybody's time and is frustrating to everybody. What he did is that once a quarter, he sat down with each individual and said, here are the measures that you're being measured on. And here's what your score is based on that. And do you have any questions and do you want to make your case differently? So he had that conversation with every single person every quarter. And so by the end of the year, there were no surprises at all. And one of the things that he said came out of that was that um, everyone really appreciated his candor and the fact that there were no surprises. They sometimes didn't agree, but they at least knew that it was fair. And that's one of the things that we're looking for with this idea of clearing barriers and some of that coaching and, and some of the candor related to, to that. Just want to stress again how important manager capability is. If you're not working on it and if you're not including it as part of the, the goal that you have for performance management, you really, really, really should. Um, and there's a little bit more information in that report that we'll send out to you that, that can help with this. All right. The last one that we're going to talk about today is this idea of clarity. Um, another executive from our Red Thread study said people want to know what they're doing. The feedback is still based on performance, but quickly moves to, so what do I need to do? So feedback is important, but quickly it moves to, what do I actually need to do about it today? And this is where some of the more traditional things like coaching comes into play. I want to make a case, uh, not a case, but I want to share some data with you about the fact that not all people within the organization have the same clarity. So we looked specifically at a, a male-female cut because it's very hard to get to get any kind of other data. But when we looked at the male-female cut for our performance data, we found that women are four times more likely to say that clear goals would help improve performance, which means they're not having clear goals right now. 16% are less likely to find the current data they receive very useful. And two times as likely as men to say that having data-based insights would be helpful to them in improving performance. So a lot of times we think we're treating everybody fairly, but almost always in almost all of the organizations that we've talked to, um, there tends to be a fairly big difference between how women experience performance management and how men experience performance management. And so as you put your systems and processes into place, it'll be very important to take a look at some of the things that you can affect um, like how performance reviews are rated or taking a look at the language used and the, the directness. The directness often varies between men and women. Men get, you know, you need to do this and women get, well, you do this sort of well and maybe you should, should improve in this area. And so more directness and, and more sort of solidity, I guess, when it comes to, to women versus men. So clarity in a hybrid world. Um, basically breaks down into three things. Today's goals. So our analysis um, revealed that when organizations create a high degree of clarity for the short term, they are 26 more likely, 26% more likely to have high levels of employee engagement. This is a big deal. One organization that we talked to um, encourages managers to center the first conversation that they have in the year with their employees on their aspirations. So not on goals for like, what are you gonna do for the organization, but your aspirations. What are you going to do in the future? And starting this way actually helps them find the sweet spot between performance, what they need them to do for the year, and development. It all comes together in that one discussion and they're able to create much clearer goals. The second one is timely data. Um, according to the study, this is a study from Accenture, 83% of employees believe their performance would improve if their companies shared with them data-based feedback on their work processes and products with suggestions for how to improve them. So 83% want actual data, which is a big deal, but it can also be a challenge um, with hybrid workers. Data often isn't in numbers. Sometimes it's in the feedback that you get in the moment. So when we think about data, we should think about all kinds of data, not just data from machines. Two ways we've seen this addressed. The first one are more regular check-ins. We've seen check-ins uptick tremendously because we have to for hybrid work. We have to be more intentional in when we engage with each other. That's the first one. The second one is opening up data to individuals. This one I think is really interesting. Learning skills, performance systems are now pushing data down to the individual rather than just pushing it down to the level of the manager. And the reason that they're doing that is because organizations are realizing that sometimes managers don't share that information because it's hard information or, or, or they don't have time or it's not a priority. But when you make that information available to the 
individuals and put it in the hands of the individuals, they're more motivated to do something about it and they're more able to do something about it. And so more organizations are making sure that those individuals get that data in a way that can help them. The second, the third one that we wanna talk about here is tomorrow's direction. High clarity on tomorrow's direction increases the likelihood of high employee engagement by 34%. Nobody wants to get on a bus if they don't know where it's going. And so when we're very clear about where the organization is going and where the what we need to do in order to get there, it gives us a sense of security and, and peace that we may not have had before. So in addition to just providing clarity on goals, organizations also need to give employees a really good understanding of what's going on and what the, the broad strategic goals are, especially now when they've probably changed likely to, to COVID-19. Um, and that means sharing it broadly, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but some of the approaches that we've seen used are formal channels, such as virtual all-hand meetings, publishing useful content on the com com company intranet side, and le le leveraging other internal communication methods like blogs, videos, those types of things. One of the things that we know within organizations is when you go hybrid, some of the non-traditional informal channels for feedback and information fall down. And so we need to be much more sure about what we're going to do and what we're going to communicate to those people and make sure that all information is visible. I have rushed through those things pretty quickly. Let me um, do a quick wrap up and then we'll open it up for, uh, I'll kick it back to, to Lars. Yeah. Number one, PM can be designed to address historical deficiencies in hybrid work. We have done it poorly in the past, we can do it better, and now is the best time to do it because everything's up in the air and we can make some of those changes that we've been dying to make. A new approach to PM, looking at it as a system, that something that affects everything we do rather than just the system at the end of the year is a really big deal, but it puts a really new emphasis on some of the aspects that we talked about. And then finally, the most critical areas of focus are really clear goals and regular balanced feedback. So with that, I'm going to kick it back to, to Lars. Yeah, thanks, Danny. That's, that's, that's been fantastic uh, sharing, I think, of um, where the whole world of performance management and its impact on organizations you know, as a whole is, is, is really becoming more uh, valuable, should we say? You know, I think you know, addressing these challenges to, uh, of, of traditional approaches is, is really quite critical to do going forward. So apologies. I'm, um, sitting in Spain and being attacked by flies right now. But um, what we're going to do is um, pick up the questions, the remaining questions, and we'll, we'll respond to those at uh, another time because we're sort of running out of time uh, in our session today. Uh, so I just wanted to just uh, give everyone um, just a, a final um, understanding of, of, of where Totru is with its own thinking in bringing performance management you know, right up uh, into being a very practical solution for organizations. But just to re reinforce here that investing in that whole employee experience so that includes the you know how you manage performance it includes engagement it includes the learning and skills development that are needed desperately needed as we go ahead in the next decade um, it makes a positive difference to the bottom line if you do invest in that um, and that means um, culture it means um, processes workflows and the technology the infrastructure of, of the organization is really critical just so moving on, um, this is where I think we're all trying to get to, uh, right? You know, a, a really congruent experience, you know, something that's fluid, friction free, um, a talent experience, as I would call it, where you feel part of that cohesive team, you have the right resources, you are praised and recognized, or you receive constructive feedback accordingly, you know what you need to do when you need to do it, um, and that you've got continual opportunities to improve um, in, in your role. Um, so, you know, that's something I think we all aspire to. Um, hopefully some of you in the audience have, have, are achieving that. If, do, if you are, then please share some of those, uh, those stories with us um, uh, when you can. But um, really just to emphasize, I think something I raised earlier in the session is that learning, engagement and performance all are intertwined together. Um, and I think Danny's already brought that up quite starkly and clearly in, in the research that, that she's doing um, and finding out in the, in the workplace um, at large is that um, having a clear sense of purpose, having uh, a, an environment 
um, a work environment that has, that is psychologically safe, that you do have autonomy to do what you do well and to do it better, and that you, you, know, you can master those skills continuously and develop new skills. They're all really critical and underpin motivation in the workplace. And therefore, bringing all of those three things together on a common platform seems to me to make solid sense. And that, that's what we've done. Um, with the talent experience platform, um, bringing together learning management, performance management, and engagement uh, collaboration together so that the, the real, um, I think, secret source that comes from that for your organization is how all of those things intertwine and how the, the data gets collected and shared and passed accordingly uh, through these three things. And that's something you can achieve um, very readily with our platform. So just to wrap up, we're on the dot of uh, of the hour top of the hour i want to thank you all for for joining us all thank danny in particular for for such an enlightening session thank you very much uh, for that we'll follow up with the report when uh, when that's available um and also if you want to see the platform in action uh, the totra platform you can do that um, just click that link that you see on the screen there the totralearning.com slash demo and, and take a look we'd uh, love to see you and also we'd love to see you inside the totra community that's also another very simple url totra.community go there um free account and you can meet well we're we'll up to five and a half six thousand um hr and learning professionals in there that you can interact with so Please come and join us there. And in the meantime, have a, a great day wherever you are in the world. And yeah, see you again soon.